He is a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. The valleys will be filled and the mountains and hills made level. The curves will be straightened and the rough places made smooth. And then all the people will see the salvation sent from God. Good to see you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Love this time of year, and it's so great to see you this morning, and so excited today to get to share God's Word with you. How many of, how many of us today would just say that from time to time we deal with some doubts? Maybe just a few of us? Yeah. A bunch of us? Most of us? Yeah. Okay, the honest people. Raise their hands. Yeah. We all go through seasons and times in our lives where we deal with doubt. Uh, sometimes as we believe God... Uh, should do something that maybe he has not, or maybe he's not done something that we think that he should. Sometimes we have a question. Sometimes we're uncertain. Sometimes we're not really sure what's going on. We go through these seasons of doubt. And uh, leading up to Christmas today, what a great time to talk about how we can overcome the doubts that, that we so often face. We're going to see today that in Matthew chapter 11, an unlikely character is dealing with doubt. I'm talking about John the Baptist, I call him JTB, sounds like a terrorist, doesn't it? JTB, John the Baptist. John is the one who introduces Jesus onto the scene. He's the one that baptizes Jesus in the River Jordan. He's the one that says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He, he's, he's Jesus' uh, predecessor, so to speak, in, in the sense that he prepared the way for, for the coming of the Messiah. And now John is facing some doubts. I mean, you would never think that John the Baptist, having this, this, this great background and all of this, this great stuff that he had done, that he would go through a season in his life where he would really question, is Jesus really the Messiah? But in Matthew chapter 11, that's exactly what's going on. John has gone through some very, very tragic circumstances that are going on, and it's causing him to question if Jesus really is the Christ. I want you to open with me this morning to the 11th chapter of the book of Matthew. Uh, today, where you can follow along with what we're talking about today, because I, I believe there's some powerful things today that can help us overcome our doubts. Now, doubt is not always a bad thing. Sometimes doubt can be a good thing. In fact, in seasons in my life where I have had doubts and then I have gone and, and found clarification, it's actually strengthened my faith more than anything else. But doubt can also turn into unbelief if it's not resolved and dealt with. And so we want to address doubt head on so that we don't fall off the cliff of unbelief. And uh, John the Baptist begins here in the 11th chapter of Matthew by sending his disciples to ask Jesus the question, are you really the Christ? Are you really the one that, that, that we thought that you were? John is in prison. And he's beginning to have a little doubt. Notice in verse 2, he says, When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone, someone else? And the reason that John was having doubts is because he began to hear about the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus' ministry was, was, was not something that, that many people expected. In fact, the Jewish establishment expected a political military leader to come in and to wipe out the Roman government and, and, and to, to, to rule on the throne of Israel. So they were expecting a savior to come who was more of a political military ruler rather than a suffering servant. So there was a lot of confusion among the Jews about, now who is Jesus? And listen, to even make matters more confusing, Jesus was not hanging out with the religious establishment, Pharisees, Sadducees, uh, the people that were the scholars and scribes of Judaism. Jesus was hanging out with prostitutes. He was talking with them in the streets. He was eating dinner at the house of, of, of tax collectors. And, and all of this caused some confusion around, now who is Jesus? 
And John's getting towards the end of his life. He's there in prison, and he's like, man, we need to make sure that we've got this straight. Go over there and ask Jesus what is going on. See, if we're going to, first of all, overcome doubt, we have to clarify our Christ. We've got to know exactly who Jesus really is. Who is Jesus? Now, we look in our culture. There's a lot of different versions of Jesus. People think Jesus is a lot of different things. Different, uh, people, individuals. There's a lot of identity crisis that goes on. Some people think Jesus was just a teacher or a sage, kind of like a wise old man sitting on a park bench smoking a pipe, you know, philosophizing about the meaning of life. Jesus was so much more, so much more than a teacher. Did he teach? Of course he did. Was Jesus primarily a teacher? No. Jesus was a savior. In fact, he said in the gospel of Luke, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. So Jesus' primary purpose in life was to come, was to reconcile humanity to God. It was to connect us with Him. So Jesus is not just a teacher, and some people think He's like a mythological character. You know, it's kind of like the Tooth Fairy, or kind of like Santa Claus, you know, Jesus. And He kind of fits into that category for many people. You know, if you're if you're naughty, you know you get punished. If, if, you, if you're nice, you know you get lots of presents. That's the gospel according to Santa Claus, right? And a lot of people have the gospel according to Santa Claus mentality when it comes to, to Jesus Christ. But, but Jesus was not a mythological character, and he wasn't just a teacher or, or a sage. He was a savior, and he came in order that we could have that relationship with God. But if we're going to overcome doubt, we've got to get the identity of Jesus clear in our minds. We've got to get that identity clear. Now, over this last year, I've been getting these phone calls, these, these, these random phone calls from, from uh, some bill collector, a bill collecting, collection agency, and they're looking for a guy named James Zeller. James Zeller. I have never heard of James Zeller in my entire life. And they, the, these guys were calling me like three or four times a day, driving me crazy. I don't know what it is with bill collectors, man. They are like demon-possessed or something like that. They are all over. How I was like, this is crazy. So finally, after getting all these repeated messages, we're looking for James Zeller. You know, we need his phone number. We need to contact him, blah, 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 blah. I picked up the phone instead of letting it go to voicemail, and I said, I don't know James Zeller. And the voice on the other end of the line was one of the bill collectors, and he said, James, we know where you are. <laughs> I'm like, you guys are crazy. This guy was so good, he was trying to convince me that I was James Zeller. <laughs> I mean, this guy was real good. I paused for a moment. I thought, well, maybe I am, you know. <laughs> Get my checkbook out, you know, write some checks. How much do you need? You know, that kind of thing. James, we know where you are. James, quit running. You know, is what he's... And I told the guy, I said, look, I am not James Zeller. Just because our last names rhyme does not mean that I know where this guy is or that I've even heard of this guy. Finally, they quit calling, but I got another call this week, and it reminded me of this. There's identity confusion. Identity confusion. And where there is identity confusion, there is uncertainty. And this is what's going on in the life of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is in prison. He's thinking, okay, Jesus is with sinners. He didn't come in with an army. Okay, I want to make sure that I got this whole thing straight. And he sends the disciples over to check this out. You know, the reason that this is so important is because the way that we see God has a profound effect on the way that we see ourselves. Do you know that? If you see God merely as a judge, a divine scorekeeper, somebody that's coming after you, you, you will see yourself through the lens of judgmentalism and condemnation, and you'll treat other people that way too. If you see God as, as merely uh, permissive, overly permissive, kind of like Santa Claus, uh, you will never respect him, and your lifestyle will reflect that. If you see God as a God full of grace and love, uh, that will begin to be reflected in the way that you see yourself and the way that you treat others. So we've got to get this, this, this Jesus thing straight in our mind. Who is Jesus? He is the Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary, uh, lived a sinless life, died on a cross, rose from the grave in order that we could be reconciled 
to God. That, that's who Jesus is. And, and the question is, well, then how can we continue to know Jesus? We have to discover what the Scripture says. Now, the Scripture is our roadmap to life. It's our roadmap to our spirituality. It is our roadmap to God, the Word of God. So we've got to clarify the Christ. We've got to discover what the Scripture says. We've got to find out, well, what does the Bible say? And it's interesting, Jesus begins to address the doubt of John the Baptist by quoting the Bible. He quotes the Old Testament prophet Isaiah in the 35th chapter. Now, this is what he says in verse 4 of Matthew 11. Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. So Jesus is saying, look, tell John lives are being changed. You know, that's how you know where Jesus is at work, where lives are being changed. That, that, that is one of the, 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 the most exciting things about being a part of the local church is seeing the lives changed. We're going to share with you a video in just a little bit about lives being changed. Last week, we, we had a huge group of people get baptized. Lives are being changed. When, when Jesus shows up, Hearts are changed. Marriages are reconciled. Lives are changed. Attitudes are transformed. That, that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, listen, look at the fruit. You can always tell if it's of God when you begin to see real spiritual fruit that is going on. But Jesus quotes the Bible. He quotes the, the prophet Isaiah from hundreds of years before to authenticate his ministry. And, and he points uh, John and his disciples back to this. And that's why the Bible plays such an important role in the life of every Christian because Romans chapter 10 says faith comes uh, by hearing and hearing by the Word of God in one translation. And then the New Living Translation says faith comes by listening to the message of the good news. So when we listen to the message of the good news, it builds faith. So if you're looking at your life and you're saying, man, I'm full of doubt, Ask yourself, how much faith is being infused into your life? How much am I reading the Word of God? How much am I listening to the Word of God? How much am I following the Word of God? Is the Word of God in my mind? Because when we begin to doubt, we begin to drift away from the Scripture. But when we begin to, 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 to draw close to the Word of God and, and to really understand it, to follow it, to read it, to study it, to live it, to obey it, what happens? It begins to build the faith. Begins to build the faith. So if you're doubting today, ask yourself, what is your word intake? And the remedy for doubt is, is studying the word. Now, when we're not in the word, we, what, what happens? We believe, sometimes, sometimes we get off onto theological tangents. We believe things about God that are not true. And if you believe things about God or about Jesus that are not true, you will always be disappointed. Absolutely. Some people think that if it's God's will, it's always easy. Right? You know, let me decide what God's will is. Okay, whatever is easiest, I'll do that. Not necessarily the case. Sometimes doing what God has called you to do is very difficult. And just because it's difficult doesn't mean that it's not God's will. Sometimes people say, well, God is an impersonal force. He cannot be known. Man, if you believe that, your life is going to be filled with massive amounts of doubt and uncertainty. Sometimes we believe that God wants us to be healthy and wealthy all of the time. And if we believe that, we miss some key chapters of Scripture. We will be disappointed as well. Uh, some people say well, you get to heaven by being a good person or, 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 or by so many other things. These things will lead us down to the wrong path, to the, to, to the path of disappointment and disillusionment and ultimately to doubt. What does the Bible say? The Bible says so many things today. We could talk several weeks about this, but let me just give a few examples today because we're talking about infusing your faith today to help you overcome the doubts that you're experiencing. And the Bible tells us He'll never leave us or forsake us. You know, God is always with us, that He is concerned with our every need, that Jesus is the advocate at the right hand of the Father who is uh, always making intercession. He's praying for us. He sympathizes with our weaknesses, and we could go on and on and on. And all of these things are seen in the Word of God. So Jesus redirects the disciples of John the Baptist. He says, 
listen, you need to understand who I am, and then you need to understand what the Scripture says, clarify the Christ, discover what the Scripture says, and then don't let circumstances ruin your faith. Don't let circumstances ruin your faith. Now, obviously, John is imprisoned, and anybody that's on death row would certainly have their faith stretched a little bit. And uh, you notice in verse 2 of Matthew 11, John the Baptist was now in prison. So John's doing a little thinking. You know, he realizes that the end of his life is probably near. And so a little doubt creeps in. You know, when you go through hardship in your life, that's when doubt always comes. You know, it's unusual that somebody would say, I have all these new doubts. My health is great. My family is blessed. I'm making more money than I've ever made before. You know, life couldn't be better. And oh, by the way, I have all these questions. The questions in life come when the bottom falls out. That's when you're struggling. That, that's when you're facing those difficulties, you know. That's when, when something unexpected begins to come your way. That, that's when doubt comes. So the circumstances of John the Baptist are causing him to question. Before, he was full of faith. But now, because of these circumstances, he begins to, to question what is going on. And one of the mistakes that we make is we interpret the Bible through our experiences. Think about this. We look at our life, how we feel, what's gone on in our lives. We interpret what the Bible says through how we feel or what we've gone through. In reality, it should be the opposite. We should be interpreting the experiences through the Bible. You know, what does the Bible say about these experiences? And going the other direction. As long as we look at our experiences to dictate to us what we're to believe and to think, we will be on the path of confusion and uncertainty. Now, why was John the Baptist in prison? He was arrested by Herod. And Herod was the king of the Jews over this region in Galilee. And, and Herod was kind of a creepy dude. He stole his brother's wife. Okay? That's not nice. Don't do that. Some of you will be around some family for Christmas. Don't think about that. That's not good. And John the Baptist was not shy. I mean, after all, he was eating locusts and honey in the desert. You know, he was a rough dude. He called King Herod out. He was like, man, you're living in adultery, man. You're stealing your brother's wife, and you need to get right with God, you know. And uh, Herod was offended by this, but he was afraid to do anything to John because John had such a huge following. But the wife that he had stolen, her name was Herodias, and she despised John the Baptist even more than Herod did. She, she kind of came up with a little scheme. One night at a party, she had her daughter come and dance before Herod and some of his guests. And this dance pleased him so much. And I don't know what kind of dance it was. You can just kind of imagine. But Herod really liked this dance. And so after he saw the dance, he said, I will give you whatever you want up to half my kingdom. Well, she went and conspired with her, her mom who had left her dad to come be with King Herod. And, and she said, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. She comes back, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. Well, Herod didn't want to do that. He didn't want to cause a massive uprising, but he was already on the record for it. And so he goes and he has him immediately arrested, and he's imprisoned. And that's when he's asking these questions in Matthew chapter 11. And then shortly after this, he is beheaded, and he does exactly what he committed to do. Now, this whole thing with Herod and the arrest of John the Baptist and stealing his brother's wife and his, you know, quasi, you know, stepdaughter, whatever you want to call it, dancing before him, that whole thing sounds a little redneck to me. You know, I don't know about you. But this is what's going on in the Bible. And I love the Bible because it just always tells us the raw and the real and, and, and gives us the facts and the hard stuff and the weird stuff and all that. It's, it's just all in there. But John the Baptist's trials caused him to second-guess the ministry of Jesus. Maybe you've been that way, been there in a marriage before. You get married, you think, man, this is going to be perfect, it's going to be awesome. A few years later, you get into the marriage and you're like, my spouse likes to spend money in a very different way than I like to spend money. I like to save money, they like to spend all the money. Or you realize oh, wow, we're really different. In fact, the families that we come from, they could not be, there could not be two families that were any more 
different than our two families. And you kind of go through a period and you, you start to kind of question it. You kind of you doubt, you know. I want to encourage all of our uh, marriages and families today that are going through a season of doubt, listen, don't let your doubt knock you out. You've got to hang in there with your marriage. You've got to hang in there. You've got to keep fighting. You've got to keep believing. But there are times and circumstances when, when we will begin to question where we are and what we've done because of what's going on. And you understand the world of John the Baptist now, even though he has done great things for God, and God has used him in a great way in the life and ministry of Jesus. Now he's in prison. He's you know, chained up to a wall, and he's starting to ask some questions. He's starting to look at those circumstances. But I want to challenge you today to rise above your circumstances and discover who Christ is and to fill your mind and your heart with the Word of God. Now, it's easy to talk about what God hasn't done, but we could talk a lot more about what God has done. What God has done. Because God has done a lot. And sometimes we let like that one little bitty thing come into our life and begin to cause us to doubt when we see all this huge stuff that God's done in the past. We get fixated on that one thing. But you know, they say that many of the top atheists in the, in the history of the world, many of the top atheists were people that had really bad circumstances. They were people that hated or did not even know their fathers. I'm talking about Madeline Mary O'Hara. I'm talking about Karl Marx, Bertrand Russell, Sigmund Freud, and, 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 and many others. They did not have a, a healthy, normal relationship with the father. So, when it came to believing in a heavenly father, now I'm seeing my circumstances through the lens of my experiences. And, 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 and it can cause us to lose objectivity. It can cause us to really not look at the facts because I've been hurt. I've been injured. I went through this. I had this experience. And so, God really can't be this. And, and, and you wonder, well, why would somebody just become an atheist, or why would somebody believe this? Many times it's because circumstances have happened. We have to rise above our circumstances. You could find a circumstance to believe or not believe anything that you want to believe. Let's look at the objective facts. Jesus was resurrected from the grave, and over 500 people saw him in one, one outing. Okay, Jesus did not rise from the grave and just appear to like three little guys in a cave that were smoking something weird. I mean, Jesus appeared to a mass group of people, a lot of folks. All of the Old Testament, hundreds of prophecies fulfilled by Jesus. We've got to look at the facts, not just how we feel or how we've been hurt or or, or what's going on in our lives. Marilyn Manson, you know, the goth rock artist, he, he says that he became an atheist because he went to a Christian school and these kids were hypocrites. Listen, I hope that we have enough common sense to, to look at our faith beyond what a couple of punk teenagers did in high school, right? I mean, come on, man. That's kind of like the other day I was driving over here to the office and a soccer mom and a Toyota Sienna, she had three kids in there, mid-30s, pulled out in front of me. She cut me off. Can you believe that? And my first thought was, all soccer moms struggle with road rage. I thought about it a little bit more, and I'm like, some, maybe many. <laughs> But not all <laughs> struggle with road rage, right? That would be kind of silly for, for us to think that, right? I mean, it would be kind of weird to, you know, come on, man. You've got to get, get over that. It's not about the road rage. Several years ago, I was eating breakfast over at McDonald's, and uh, I'd ordered some hash browns, and they, they didn't give me enough of them. And so I said to the lady, I said, ma'am, can I please have my hash browns? I thought I was pretty nice. This lady working at McDonald's took some of the hash browns and threw them at me. I was like, somebody's having a bad day. And I thought to myself, I am never going back to McDonald's. And then I realized, it's probably not that at McDonald's headquarters they 
teach the people that make the hash browns to hurl them at customers. <laughs> it's probably just maybe one person, right? We, we have to be so careful about the, the generalities and the assumptions that we make uh, based on the experiences that we have, right? And John is corrected by Jesus in saying, look at the fruit. John, I know you're in prison, and I know John's thinking, why has Jesus not busted me out of here? You know, that's what he's thinking. I need Jesus to come, you know, knock a hole in this prison cell and all that. Jesus is doing all these miracles for everybody else. Why didn't he for me? All that. I'm sure he felt that way. But we have to not just look at our own lives by our own experiences. Let's look at what the Bible says, the Word of God, because at the end of the day, it's the only thing that's objective. You know, We are all filled with subjectivity. Now, the response of Jesus is really amazing about John the Baptist. You would think that he would go on to the blacklist, that John the Baptist would be earmarked as this defective disciple. Notice what Jesus says to him. I tell you the truth, beginning in verse 7, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. For all the prophets of the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus is affirming John. Jesus is not throwing John under the bus. And this tells us that we have to remember that Jesus is patient with our doubt. This is why Christ, that's why Jesus is such a great Savior. He is patient with us in those moments of doubt. He's calling him still the greatest man who ever lived. He's got some doubt in his life. The important thing is we don't let the doubt sideline us. Lead us off into the cliff of unbelief. We've got to deal with it. And Jesus speaks highly of John. And listen, when you go through some doubts in your life, you need to know God still believes in you. Jesus Christ still cares about you. I love John 8, 32. It says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You keep studying God's word. You keep seeking the heart of God. You keep filling your mind with 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 the things of God, and God will begin to show you things that you did not even believe were possible. If you confront your doubts, you'll begin to find resolution. If you let them kind of linger, they have the ability to drag us into to so many places that we really don't want to go. So what do we have to do? We've got to clarify the Christ, discover what the Bible says, don't let circumstances ruin our faith. And remember that Jesus still believes in us even when we go through periods of uncertainty. I, I love Mark 9. Uh, it's the story of a father and a son. The son has an evil spirit. The son is standing before Jesus. And, and Jesus is, is, is about to, to, to drive out this evil spirit. But the father says something that is so honest. It's so direct. Check this out, Mark 9, 23 and 24. Jesus said, everything is possible for him who believes. And immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. There's belief and there's unbelief. There's doubt, there's faith. And many times in life, we teeter back and forth between the two. A little more this way one day, a little more that way the next moment. But, but the Father says, help my unbelief. And that's what we want to cry out to God to do this morning.